Perspective introduces a new approach to visualization for the Ignition platform, which really takes advantage of mobile devices and the many screen sizes from phones all the way up to you know, uh, TV monitors. To develop screens for a multitude of devices, one would have to build a screen for each um, screen size, which can be really time consuming. You don't really want to do that. So Perspective leverages web technologies uh, like HTML5 and CSS with all the layout managers there to give and allow you to create mobile responsive screens that can adapt um, with having a single project and a single set of you know, things that you're, you, know, you want to define. And that's really important here, but it makes you have to think about it in a completely new way and <laughs> how you're going to approach uh, the design of the project. So with that said, um, we, we want to kind of focus on three areas here, uh, design and layout, security, and uh, you know, data from mobile devices. And in terms of if we're going to plan for projects, we've got to look at these three things. So let's start with the topic of design and layout. Uh, design and layout represents a fair chunk of your planning process. Since you're building visualization interfaces, it's important to spend some time on how to develop applications that are the most efficient and effective as possible for your users. Let us uh, now look at some considerations to help accelerate your design and layout development. Sense Perspective allows you to build views for multiple screen sizes. We want to first start by defining the screen sizes uh, the screens and their sizes that will interface with your project. And this is one that I can't stress enough. Knowing the type of uh, devices or terminals that you'll be interfacing with will help you understand exactly how you want to approach the application. So as you can see here on the screen, I've got two different ones that I've targeted, uh, a phone and tablets or, or larger displays, uh, which are basically something that's less than, a four, less than or equal to 400 pixels. That is going to be one size that I want to, uh, to work with. And then something that's greater than 400 pixels, I want to work with that. So knowing these two things and really auditing um, you know, who's going to be working with it, that will give you an idea of how uh, you know of what you're going to need to do for each of these different sizes, uh, and potentially which layout manager we were talking about earlier that we want to use. When it comes to user interactions, we need to understand how users will interact with our screens. Um, and understand understanding users will so understand that users will interact with screens depending on if the input is a mouse or a keyboard or a touch interface. We need to know these details because that will help you understand which container type to to best use. Consider what interactions your users will have with each of the screens. Establish the overall purpose of each view so that you and your users can clearly understand what data is being presented and what specific actions can be accomplished. Defining these interactions can help you best map out the types of events to configure for your views and their associated actions. And this will also help be helpful to map out the parameters that will be passed into views and what transforms you may use uh, to present the most relevant data to your user. So this, again, I can't really stress enough. If, I look at, if I'm targeting two different sizes, a phone and a, and a tablet, uh, it really need, we need to look at our, our screens and, and determine what's the best use of that information or that data uh, for a phone and for, you know, say, a PC or tablet. And, and will that be different? Will it be the same? So really got to have to kind of think about that. And if I'm on a phone, remember, it's, it's smaller. And you, when you, you know think about the apps you use in you know on your phone <clears throat> outside of the industrial world, you want that to be optimized. You want that to be efficient uh, for the user. The next part of designing of the design planning process is to define your user's navigation. This will help you plan out how users can best navigate your application. You can use the information you gather from the user's interactions to help formulate your navigation strategy. I would recommend using a flowchart to help map out how a user will navigate through different views and pages. Having a, a map of your user's journey will help you understand how to best approach navigation for each of the screen sizes to find your project. And again, this comes back to understanding how perspective works. Um, you know, with, with perspective, I'm going to kind of go to the designer just for one moment here, because what you're doing is when you first get into the application, you are defining um, all of, uh, you know, for the, the first view that their users are going to see, you're going to define what uh, view that's going to be. And then you can define docs, uh, north, south, east, and west docs, uh, which in my case, I have the header and the menu. The menu is going to be on demand in my case, where I'm bringing it out when I want it um, there. And that's where my navigation is, is in that menu that I bring out. But it might very well be that your navigation is inside of a window, maybe tabs uh, for your navigation. Or maybe you just have one screen. You, have, you click on that to drill into more parts of the application. So you really need to understand uh, the, the, how the navigation is going to work. Plus. We have the ability to specify URLs um, for perspective. And so here, for example, I've got forward slash bindings, forward slash events, forward slash native, all these things 
that when I look at my application, that's up here in the URL. We can use URLs and pass parameters into them. And that's allows us to have bookmarkable or shareable things that we can provide to other folks. And so as an example, I can now uh, you know, go over something else. So let's say I want to go over to the, uh, the embedded uh, one. So I click on that. Now I'm going to go straight into that embedded view. I can get to that there. I can also, of course, get to it by the navigation that I have. So there's a couple different ways you can kind of approach that. And again, understanding that's going to help you understand how to best go at it. Once you've collected information and you define the essential pieces related to the design of your project, you can now start the wireframe uh, to wireframe your design. The process of wireframing helps you clearly define how your views will look, especially for the different target screen sizes. You will go through multiple iterations of wireframes. Please, trust me, you will. Whittling down the layout and design to highlight the most important functions. This will, this will help you save time and frustration during that build process instead of trying an, a trial and error while you're building. And I, again, I can't stress this enough. I always tell people, please just draw it out first, how you want this to approach, especially potentially how you want it to help you determine which layout to use first and how things inside of that will work. So wireframing can help you identify you know, which views are common. They can help you in building templates. They can really help you save a lot of time. Uh, and it can also bring your stakeholders in who can look at the examples so that they can provide feedback. So here is an example of a wireframe that, uh, that our UI UX folks did for our uh, vision client launcher that we have. Uh, so we launch a vision client or we launch a designer, the similar process there. And there are you know, many options and tools to choose from for wireframing, but really you, know, you don't need fancy tools. You can just simply sketch it out like we did here on a, uh, with pencil and paper. And once you have the wireframe you're comfortable with, then you can share that with the, st the stakeholders, get that feedback. Throughout that process, you're going to fine tune it until you arrive at the final design. So you can kind of see our iteration to our final screen design. Um, and this is something that, it, you know, it, really anybody can wireframe. Um, and then you take, you can actually take the wireframes also to a UI UX expert who can then, uh, you know, turn that into actual, uh, you know, color and branding, which is really the next part, which is the defining your, your, your theme, your branding, your color schemes for your application. Your brand will help you establish the colors that you will be using in your project. Establishing a color scheme will ensure consistency across your project and will help other project developers to know which colors have a purpose. Also, to help you, your development move along faster, gather all the assets you need for your design. So collect all the images, symbols, uh, SVGs, graphics, um, that will, uh, that will uh, grabbing it all together, you know, creating the colors and like a spreadsheet, knowing what you have will, will certainly help and accelerate your development. Another point I'd like to add is that if you do not have a graphic design resource, again, you can reach out to a UI UX uh, designer expert. Uh, there, there are online resources like guru.com and others you can use uh, as well. These graphic designers can create designs based on your needs and can drop them right into, into your project. Uh, as you can see, planning and preparing your design layout can greatly speed up the process now that you've gathered, gathered your requirements, collected all of your assets, and arrived at your final design, you're all set to start develop the development process in perspective. So I, I like to take the, this moment to highlight some of the great resources that we, that we have that can help you with your design and layout efforts. First, I'd like to talk about touchscreens. Since some devices range in size, it's important to consider touch ergonomics. I highly recommend that you visit our, uh, on, your, our online user manual and find the section Perspective Design Principles. In that section, you'll find a subsection on touch and ergonomics that will give you some guidance on how to lay out your design for mobile devices. For some great design resources, I recommend visiting inductiveautomation.com and heading over to our webinars area under the resources section. You can filter by HMI and you'll find a ton of great in-depth content on screen design and best practices, such as Design Like a Pro, Building Mobile Responsive HMIs and Reignition Perspective. So we have a lot of great content out there uh, and this one's really helping you to understand the planning process when it comes to actual design, there's other resources that you can look into for that, along with working with UI UX folks um, that will help you get to where you want to go and make that a first class application. Uh, you know, and this is really just to just just so that you can have a very consistent application you can that's scalable, you can move forward with. Of course, you can you can build applications pretty rapidly with uh, with perspective. But if you really want to take advantage of all of these things we're talking about, it's good to go through this process. Now, moving right along, uh, I do want to spend some time on security considerations for your perspective project. Uh, spending time in security not only will help your development time, but it will also help making sure your project and applications are secure throughout your organization. And you know, when we look at access, we really do have to look at security. Uh, what I do want to review is that is what the perspective module has to has to offer in terms of security. 
uh, it was really built from the ground up with modern cybersecurity in mind. It supports industry leading protocols and standards. It's compatible with many federated identity providers such as OpenID, Connect, and SAML protocols. It supports two-factor authentication or single sign-on with these federated providers, and it has a permissions model that allows you to secure your apps with flexibility and ease, uh, defining things like security levels and you know, using roles and zones and really applying that to your application. So here's really a closer look at how Perspective approaches security. And this is a great diagram to really understand why Perspective, you know, why it was built from the ground up with cybersecurity in mind, because you know, at the end of the day, it's a client, it's a, you know, we have a, it's a ignitions on a server and we're having clients out there that can access the application we provide. And when they, when they go to that URL, you know, to access the application, we want to make sure that, you know, first they have to authenticate, they have to be authenticated and we want to be able to verify that identity of that person. That's where federal identity and the two factor authentication becomes really important. So in that browser, they'll authenticate, we'll have that validation, we'll know who they are. And that will be done over a secure um, encrypted connection to the server using HTTPS. So we'll have that secure tunnel between the browser and the server. So there's no outside actors that can actually see that data or manipulate that data in the middle. But then, you know, what's important here to understand is that perspective, you know, in that client, we want to get access to tag data. We want to get access to database information. We want to be able to read and write potentially. There are things that we want to be able to do. Um, and we want to protect those resources. And Perspective really makes it, uh, it, it does a lot of work to, to really protect that. So when we validate, when, when I log in and validate a session against the server, against that federal identity, I'll know what the, who that user is and what, what roles or security levels they will have. And that's on the server, that's stored on the server. Nothing, there's nothing there on the client that takes advantage of that, it's all on the server. All the things that then they want to interact with, all the data they want to get access to are all behind a protected layer. So these are bindings and, and scripting, and scripting you know, to get information from databases or tags or whatever else. And uh, this protected layer basically says, hey, if I'm a browser and I want that data, the, you know, if I want to write or if I want to read, then we have to have the right proper uh, you know, permissions to, to, in order to do that. And so all we're really doing is when we establish a session, all of those views and components and properties and bindings are all running on the server. And when those things update and the binding updates, it sends it to the browser, it updates the browser, we get the value. If I want to write, the browser simply just says, hey, I, here's a write, it writes to a property, it gets synced to the server, the server says, oh, let's check the, let's, let's check the authentication. Do, are they allowed to write? Okay, yeah, they are, then I'll write that down. So there's really limited ways that the browser interacts with the server to, be, to really have a full secure system here. And if we talked about events earlier. If I have a mouse click event or a file upload event, those events are also sent to the server, checked against the same uh, permission models, and then if we pass it, we can then actually go off and run those events. So it's a really baked in from the beginning to have cybersecurity in mind. And we want to make sure that we do, you know, uh, take advantage of, of using, you know, uh, of actually setting up security and all that. So let's take a look at the security considerations for perspective. Uh, I want to cover four important aspects here that will help you save time and ensure your project is protected. So first is uh, hardening your ignition gateway. Uh, we need to identify who will have access and how they have access. We're gonna, we're gonna figure out where users will access the application from and then cons considerations for mobile device security, um, i.e. like location-based stuff. So let's take a look at those uh, real quick. Sense Perspective allows you to build mobile responsive applications HTML5. Your application can be viewed on a multitude of, device, of devices via web browsers or native mobile apps. You'll need to make sure your, uh, your gateway is secure. I wanna emphasize that it's important to set up security ahead of time, take advantage of the security features of Perspective. That involves enabling SSL for data encryption, setting up authorization for your users, enable auditing to track all the actions in your project. And for a more in-depth look at all of this, um, you, you can uh, visit our and look at our security hardening guide, which can help you uh, secure that project. And that was updated for now with Ignition 8 in perspective. So um, go ahead and take a look at that. I also recommend uh, visiting our past webinar, Changing Your Perspective on Security, which goes through these steps in more detail. The next thing I want to recommend you focus on as part of your, your their security planning is to identify your users' access. You want to audit your organization and determine who your users are. Identify access levels ahead of time. This will help you. This will help your development process. Look into what actions people would take that were, would require security. Consider the security levels based on roles. When you integrate with your organization's role management system, you can use that information to determine access permissions. Identify which screens in your applications are open to the public and which would require authentication. 
you will want to determine which screens require access levels and what actions need access levels. So who can do what and what, you know, exactly what can they do in the application based on uh, their levels. Keep in mind too, that you have the ability for, you know, accessing a URL. You want to make sure that, uh, you know, that we protect every part of that perspective, that perspective project, uh, whether it's from the get-go or whether we want to have specific screens that have higher heightened security on them. Perspective, perspective gives you a, a lot of control when it comes to security. Due to the nature of how perspective handles security, making security an afterthought will hamper your development efforts. To help you gather information and give you and your development team a good idea of how to approach security, I recommend building a flow chart as well to map out what that security would look like. All right, the third part of the planning process I'd like to consider is your data sources. It's a good idea to identify and map out all the data sources that feed into your ignition gateway. Um, so you have things like PLCs that we're connected directly to, uh, databases that we're working with, uh, other data sources like MQTT servers or OPC UA servers, uh, maybe a REST API that we're dealing with, or maybe a connection to SAP or another ERP system. Uh, maybe we're reading files in, maybe we're looking at uh, barcode scanners that are sending data over the network. There's all sorts of different things, uh, data that's gonna be coming in. You want to look at all of those and understand what those data sources are, where they're coming from, have a, a spreadsheet that gives you that, that, that understanding, because that's gonna help you understand how you're gonna use it, especially in the application itself. Um, and, and, and what you, you want to do with it. Plus, it'll, it'll also let you give you a good, better picture of, for security of what connections are secure and which ones are not secure. So you may want to take extra precautions there, especially with firewalls and whatever else. So really get a kind of understanding of all those data sources that you have. Then now keep in mind that Perspective also adds additional data sources uh, through your mobile device that I showed you with the access to the GPS, the accelerometer, the camera, NFC, uh, Bluetooth, you have, uh, it really elevates the, the amount of things you can do. So to help you prepare, um, defining what sensor data you would like to access and what action and purpose it will serve is, is an important first step. So just to kind of go through these, um, you know, for, for GPS, you know, I showed the GPS there, but it can be really powerful in using that for geofencing. We can tag our location when people are entering data. We can also have navigation based on uh, on GPS. So going back to that navigation strategy, I might actually change the screen automatically based on where that user is located. The accelerometer, um, that is can be a great uh, uh, tool where you can you know, use your, your phone uh, to determine like X, Y coordinates. Uh, you, can, it, you can maybe do something different in portrait or landscape mode with your application. You've seen a lot of apps where they'll do something different there. Uh, it's a good way of, of using that. And uh, there's also talks of people using this to for, for safety. So they would know if somebody fell or not, or uh, you know, based on you know, the, the, the results of, of that accelerometer. Another thing is, the, is camera and barcode scanning. Uh, barcode scanning, we're seeing customers put barcodes out there in the plant floor. You could take a, you know, like I showed earlier, you take, take a scan that barcode and you can do things like inventory control. You can use it for navigation. You can have, I'll put a pop-up window to get more context about that location, about the asset, get it to you know, procedures and a lot more. Uh, use those to your advantage. It's a great data source you can bring into your system. NFC. Uh, a lot of devices uh, use NFC, um, you know, these are called for near field communication. And this allows, you know, these devices communicate with each other over a short distance. So uh, you, you, you've seen this with contactless payment with your mobile device. And uh, a lot more NFCs out, uh, devices out there that you can interface with. Uh, it could also be very similar to barcode scanning, or you can actually kind of go and, and as you pass through a, a tag that has, you know, that you, that you connect with NFC, you can get the information, you can do something with that information and ignition. Uh, Bluetooth uh, is can be really great. There are a lot of uh, Bluetooth low energy, um, you know, sensors and devices like beacons uh, that give you humidity and temperature. Uh, things like uh, maybe iBeacon, Eddystone, uh, these things you can work with and and bring in and be a part of that. Uh, it's really anything that's Bluetooth low energy you can bring into uh, perspective. 